NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lenders. Woo! As an adult, don't we all miss spring break? Nothing like taking a week off from all your responsibilities. Well, here's the next best thing for adults, a spring break from house payments. SaveWithConrad.com can help you get rid of all your credit card debt, just like that. We're routinely helping our listeners save five, six, seven, even 800 bucks a month. And you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this, but check this out. No house payments for two months. at SaveWithConrad.com. Y'all, if you haven't heard already, it is smooth sack summer, baby. That's right. When you're playing in the summer sun, make sure you're scaped from pubes to bum. That's right. This is the summer to keep your balls cool while still looking hot with Manscaped. The leaders in below the waist grooming are making sure we all have a ball this summer by giving our pants partners everything they need to stay fresh. Dive head first into smooth sack summer by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with our promo code POA. Y'all, this is Trey here. You know, back in my day, in the in, in the early 20s and whatnot, I used to keep pretty groomed up down there. At least I tried to. I was out on the scene doing things, you know. Can't even count how many times I nicked myself. It was a risky operation. It was. And like many things, when I got married, I let that part of myself go. Not fair, but it's just what happens. I didn't really think about it again until Manscaped came into my life, and I realized how unfair I had been to my wife, making her deal with that veritable wilderness down there. It was. The other day, a few months ago, I looked down there, and there was a, a 19th century explorer looking for the lost city of El Dorado in my pubes. I said, what are you doing there? You son of a bitch picked him out, threw him out. But either way, it's uh, getting pretty feral is my point until I got manscaped. And now, clean as a whistle, baby. What are you going to do? The stuff works. You should try it out. Starting with the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0. It's got everything you need to prepare that summer bod. They have built the ultimate grooming bundle for your summer grooming. The Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. The Lawnmower 4.0 has a 7,000 RPM motor. A new multifunction on off switch can engage a travel lock and gives you the ability to turn the 4K LED spotlight on and off when needed for a more precise shave. Did I mention this trimmer is waterproof too? Beach, lake, or shower, this razor will devour even the strongest of pubes. Now that you got the perfect haircut, use Manscaped's liquid formulations to keep that freshness even at the hottest summer barbecues. Most importantly, use the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant to stay cool in the heat. With a soothing aloe vera formula, it's the best in the business for below the waist freshness, and this clear drying formula will keep you looking good while smelling good at the same time. Also, Manscaped threw in two free gifts to the Performance Package 4.0, Manscaped boxers and the shed travel bag. Are you wearing sandals with some nasty toenails during the summer months? I happen to be doing that right now. I'm not too proud to say. Take a look at the Shears 2.0, a luxury nail grooming kit. This kit includes stainless steel nail cutters, tweezers, and grooming scissors. With the performance package, your balls will be ready to impress, but make sure you cover the rest with the Shears 2.0. So here's what you do, y'all. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code POA at manscaped.com. That's 20% off. With free shipping, if you use the code POA at manscaped.com. It's smooth sack summer, boys. Get on board or get left behind. What's up, Airheads? We got a special edition of POA this week. You probably already noticed that's not Corey sitting there. We are coming. I'm coming to you from the Airstream Studios. If you're a member of the extended SKU universe, you've been around for a while. You already know this lovely gentleman. That is uh, my weekly SKUs co-host, Smart Mark Ag. He don't like the smart part, but uh, that's Mark no. Ag either way. And filling in for Cho today as he is sitting on a beach somewhere in like Alabama or Florida or somewhere eating oysters doing uh southern white people stuff so thanks for yeah. being here Mark. Pina, pina colada in each hand eating fried oysters with his toes living his living his best doing life all of that does it every year we talked on the well-read podcast this week about how uh he's just very he's a very specific type of like southern white guy and and that's like the perfect vacation for him to to take every year is uh down there to the gulf the gulf you know, part i love i love the gulf man my um, wife and i got married on the uh, on the a Gulf Beach in Florida. Uh, water's beautiful, pristine, peaceful. As long as there's no oil spills, you I was, you know, Cho looks like a uh, Corey looks like a giant baby. Yes, uh -huh. and now he has a baby. Yes, uh, I I've just had this mental image of him and the kid wearing matching like those UV shirts. Yeah, 
Let's give yeah. him from turning pink. <laughs> That's good. I, I, yeah, Corey, to Corey's credit, he used to have a line he would do on stage where he would say he looks like a baby. He would take his hat off where you could see his bald head. And he would say mm. he looks like a baby going through a divorce, which was uh, always did pretty well and pretty accurate. So he's aware of it. But another thing yeah. I'll add is after traveling with Corey for a long time, I've seen a lot of other babies uh, see Corey. Like it will be in line at a gas station or just wherever or we're sitting at a table in a restaurant or something. There's a baby nearby. And if a baby happens to like catch sight of Corey, like mm -hmm. th they get like, utterly enraptured like like they just yeah. get like drawn in it's like they think like they're i don't know if he's like their king or some kind yeah. of like they're you know looking into the future like is this what the future holds for me i don't know what's going on in their baby brains but when they see Corey, they just like lock on to him and they cannot look away it's like they're mesmerized uh by him which is yeah. always fun it's like it's like it's like a, a a vision board for a baby yeah it's like i can that's what i'm gonna be i'm gonna be big big me yeah yeah, so Mark, thanks for doing this. You know this is a fancy people and fancy stuff podcast. I already I already know the answers to some of these questions, but people listening may not. Where uh where are where are you now and over the course of your life? Where do you fall on the uh trash to fancy spectrum? Uh <laughs> pretty pretty trash early in life. Uh, yeah. uh you know, cousins all drug dealers and out of prison um grew up on a farm my mom grew up in doing indoor plumbing uh so yeah my mom literally the county i grew up in she only left that county twice before she left to go to college yeah once she went to i'm from southern virginia her, her dad took her to richmond shopping for christmas and the other time after she started dating my dad they went to the next county over to go to the dairy queen and she thought the people there talked funny all right. Yeah. So that's, that's the little I, insular I white trash. I mean, I went to, I went two counties over a lot, Cookville, Tennessee, because that's where you went to go to school, call shopping or go to the movie theater, or like mm -hmm. to go eat red lobster on somebody's birthday or something. Yeah. You go to mm -hmm. Cookville, which was two counties over. I did that a lot growing up, but I didn't leave the state of Tennessee. I don't think. Well, I grew up on the Kentucky line, so I had been across the state line in Kentucky, but outside, I'd never gone anywhere else other than the general region where I grew up until I, graduated high school and me and some of my friends drove down to Florida of our own accord, but like growing up, never, never went nowhere, no vacations or nothing like that. No, I mean, our, our vacations would be like going to the lake, uh, going to a lake, uh, in North Carolina or something for like, a, for like a long weekend. Like, I mean, I think like I moved to Texas from, to move from Virginia to Texas after college before I literally got in the car to drive to Texas. I had only been to two States that didn't border Virginia. One of those was I went to Pennsylvania uh, once riding with my dad. He's a truck driver. And the other time was I went, I went to Myrtle Beach for senior week after college. And then so when I moved, when I when I passed through Arkansas between Tennessee and Texas, that was the only the third state I'd been to that didn't border Virginia. So I right. still don't have a passport. My wife keeps asking me to get a passport so we can maybe one day take a trip, you know. But yeah. yes, I don't, all I know about, you talk a lot about England on this show, right? Yeah, they come up quite a bit. I try to, yeah. Corey, sometimes I feel like almost frames this as like an England show. And I try to push back on that just because I don't want to be, I don't want to be hemmed in to just talking about England comes up a lot because they're, you know, they're fucking fancy and goofy. So they make good fodder for this show and everything. But yeah. like, you know, we'll talk about whoever, as long as they got a lot of money or purport to be fancy folks, as far as I'm concerned. But what were you going to say sure. about England? Oh, I was going to say, like, I, I, I read a lot about them, but I have never experienced the Hobbit motherland. So I, uh, it's just uh, purely, purely what it filters through my screens and uh, websites and books is all is what I know about them. I know they only got a bunch of funny sounding towns and they still yeah. got a king for some reason. One uh, thing I noticed, <laughs> me and Corey went over there uh, as part of the book we wrote that's coming out later this fall, by the way, that's pretty relevant to POA. <laughs> More mm -hmm. on that as we move down the road. But anyway, um, it's the first time I've been over there. And like, I remember one thing that I, I mean, I noticed a lot of things, but like one thing that I noticed was like, uh, country, the word and the concept of country is very different over there, at least as I experienced it. Right. So like in this country, or at least in the South, I guess like, like are the Hamptons, the countryside, does that count? Would people call that the countryside? They don't right? Like, 
Like in America, if you're talking about out in the country, it usually means like butt fucking hillbillies in the sticks or whatever, you know, deer hunters right. or fucking Toby Key songs, sh big trucks, shit like that. That's what country means to me. And I consider myself someone who grew up in the country and that's what it is here. Over there, the country is like fucking vineyards and bed and, bed and breakfast and rolling hills and the right. Cotswolds and, you know, gardens and farmlands. And it's all, it's all just lovely. Absolutely yeah. lovely, the country over there. Yeah, like seen, people retire to the country. Yeah, and, yeah, right. Yeah, like it's uh, so yeah, it's yeah, pretty different. So little like uh, uh, idyllic countrysides and cottages and little villages where a child's murder twenty years ago still has everyone shook. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> where do you add on uh, fancy people and fancy uh, stuff? How do you feel, feel about them? Like a little bit of luxury, you know, a nice meal is nice. And like, you know, I yeah. like to, I like drinking name brand booze. Uh, I'd rather wear brand, brand name shoes. My childhood didn't know a lot of those. Uh, but the fancier stuff sort of beyond me. Like even if, if you gave me a bag full of like $50 million, I'd probably still drive a Toyota. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> me too. sense to me. Yeah. But what uh, about like rich people? Are they the scourge of this uh, <laughs> of this earth and society, or you yes. know, yeah, right? <laughs> well, greed. I mean, greed is that's in the fucking Bible. It's like yeah. it's the, the citizen Kane. You know, it's like. But uh, you were asking me about like stories about rich people. Um, I was thinking. Yeah. About, I was thinking on it. I think I, when I first moved to Los Angeles, before I got my half-ass career in TV writing started, I wrote. For, um, I worked at retail one Christmas at a fancy department store. And it's one thing I'll never forget. This guy was like in the luggage department and was like really frustrated. And he comes up to me all flustered and goes, he was basically saying he was going to like a long international trip flying first class. And he wanted, he wanted to ask if he had any more masculine dog carriers for a small dog in the back. And I was like, <laughs> you got oh, a little Pomeranian? Do you yeah, got to carry well, on an international that's flight? That's his fault. <laughs> don't have a little, don't have a little pussy ass dog if you don't want to look like a pussy while you're turning around. <laughs> it funny. is. I was like, what am I supposed to say? Yes, so we got the we got the Carhartt camo Dickies right. Louis yeah. Vuitton pet carrier. In the Here's back. some bandoliers <laughs> you can wrap around it. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's I don't think it's, it's gonna matter. Whatever they see, what's <laughs> yeah, dude, no badass dog is gonna fit into a carrier of you know that size anyway. So it doesn't matter how you adorn the outside; people are gonna know what's up, you know. Yeah. And there's nothing I wrong think... with little foo foo dogs or whatever, but like you can't be mm -hmm. concerned about looking like a badass when you travel with one. You know what I mean? Right. Like, like a real big, a real like badass motherfucker would just be huge and badass while just carrying a Pomeranian around. Do you know what I mean? Cause that's mm -hmm. like, I mean, that's kind of what you do. You're kind of ripped. You walk, you walk like a little ass dog around and stuff, you know, and it don't bother yeah, you. I go less. Nah, I love, yeah. I love my dog. She's a little, she's like, my dog, we, we go home to my mom's like, we're walking around the farm and like, she'll she literally ran from a rabbit one time. Like, this is not a dog. This is a cat. Um, yeah, I think, it, I think like you really realize like, like when you actually like talk to a rich person, it's like, you realize there's like reality is just sort of bent yeah. in a way that like, I remember one time this old like representative I had, um, me and my buddy were talking to him and I was talking about some news story I read where somebody just spent like four years in jail waiting trial for a crime they didn't commit because they didn't have $20,000 in bail. And he goes, who doesn't have $20,000? I'm like, <laughs> Nobody I know has twenty thousand dollars except right. maybe you, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, but that was. <laughs> but the, another thing that's always stuck in my head. I was working on this show in New York, and the guy on the production company, super wealthy guy. If I said his name, a lot of you would know who he is. They were remodeling the kitchen, and the guy walks in at a, like a rich, normal rich guy time to get to work, which is like eleven thirty. Uh, he's carrying a bag of golf clubs. He drops the bag of golf clubs right where the, the construction workers are going to be doing the renovations and just calls out to no one. Somebody move there as before the worker gets here and just kept trucking. <laughs> and I was like, what? Like, the only as he brought golf clubs, you got to work at 1130, you're going to leave at three for a tea time. Yeah. And you're just making work for somebody else to do so other people can do work. And you're not going to do jack shit here all day and you make all the fucking money. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, uh, <laughs> 
it'd be like that. That's how they are. Uh, who I actually I read a story about. I'm, we might get into some wild aristocrats later, and I read this one about one of them who uh, an aristocrat from like the 1800s in England who was overly concerned with body temperature. Right? He thought uh-huh. he had to regulate his body temperature exactly, uh, despite the fact that like unless something's wrong, our bodies just do that. Uh, but he felt like it was vitally important that he needed to do that. And living in England, the way he went about it was he woke up every morning and put on seven coats because it's like, I guess England's kind of like California. It's, you know, kind of chilly in the morning or whatever, and then gradually Mm -hmm. warms up throughout the day. Right. So he start the day with seven coats. And as he went throughout the day, as the day went on, he gradually peel one off. Right. And just throw it on the ground behind him. Right. But but like the little peasants in town or whatever knew, like if you found one of his coats and returned it to him, he'd give you like a sixpence or something. Right. <laughs> so like people would like bring them back. But he he didn't even announce to the world. Somebody picked this coat up. He would just like drop the coat and keep walking and people would bring them back to him later or whatever. They just like I, uh, they things just like seem to work out for them for the most part. Yeah. So they don't understand how most anything works you're talking about that the perspective i remember one of the sitcoms i wrote was took place in a small southern town like the one i'm from and there was like a scene in it where the kids there were kid characters and they like shared a bed or something which like mm-hmm. my sons share a bedroom they have bunk beds but they don't share a bed but like you know it's not an uncommon thing right and the studio executive was like what is what's going on here like why you know like why would ch- children sleep in the same bed together? Like what? That's not, nobody does that. Like, that's not, like what, do you, what do you, I don't understand where that's coming from or whatever, you know, like yeah. that type of thing. They just, they just don't know. My, si- my sister shared a bed for a long time. Uh, but like, there's like a, when you're talking about the coat thing, I was thinking about there's like a, like a, a horseshoe theory of like where rich people and trash reconnect on a lot of yes. stuff. Yes. I, there was an, I was going to bring one up to keep going. I've, i have Go ahead. But like quack medical stuff is like one of those things. Cause like you'll read about like, yep. like not just Steve jobs trying to get Eastern cancer, like dying of pancreatic cancer. Cause he skipped on modern medicine to try to do Eastern religious stuff. But like yeah. these Silicon Valley dudes, we have blood boys. Cause they think of replacing their blood will like help uh-huh. keep them young. There's a story about a guy using his son for a blood boy last week. And like, but like, I remember to think about like the, all the like old wives tales, my aunts and stuff used to trade like one, my, one of my aunts, <laughs> Thought said like if you get an ice cream headache, just hold the bowl in your palm of hand like that, and it'll go away in like a few seconds. I'm like, ice cream headaches always go away. They just go away in a few seconds. Yeah, right. Yeah, (laughs) but like, it's like (sighs) just like quack medical shit. Like you you end up coming back around, like, like, but also like, um, what what was the story you just? I'm thinking about. There's another thing that occurred to me. The kids sleeping in a bed together. Oh yeah. Uh, If you if you replace the instead of a bed you made it like a yurt on a yoga retreat that a family was sharing because they were doing yeah. ayahuasca together they'd be like oh yeah right. that's totally <laughs> yeah well it's funny you say that because uh, like that was for a long time and i'll still do it periodically but that concept you just laid out was my segment of every episode of this show i called mm-hmm. it the venn diagram the venn diagram where like oh, fancy yeah. and trash overlap or whatever but like and i sort of covered the one you brought up i called it health fads where you talked mm-hmm. about like rich people health fads versus like, you know, trailer park health fads, like the it works wraps and stuff. But one thing that I talked to Corey about once uh, on that subject, like I feel like, uh, you know, that line, I think it's from Arrested Development, right? Where it's like, it's a banana, Michael. How much could it cost? $12 or $10 mm, or whatever. $10, yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, that, right? Like obviously rich people are like that, but also and I don't, you tell me, is this just a me thing? Am I just this, like stupid and trash at the same time. But like, I've always been kind of that way too, despite never really having money in my, like in my life. Meaning like, I don't know how much stuff costs. I've gone broke. So a comical amount of times from just like not knowing what or caring what I'm doing with like, like I remember once like early in mine and Katie's (laughs) marriage, you know, very much living paycheck to paycheck. She sent me to the store and she had squash on the grocery list. And I came back and she was like, did you spend $30 on squash? And I didn't buy that much, but it was like, there was like a squash shortage or something going on. It was like priced Mm -hmm. very high at that point in time. Right. And they had it marked as such, like it was marked clearly. This is how expensive this is right now. But I just didn't even, I just didn't even look at that. Like she told me to get squash. So I just picked up squash and brought it back. 
Uh, but you know, that would never happen to her. She would be like, fucking what? Nine ninety nine a pound or whatever it was, you know, but like, and I still, to this day, I don't, I, I just, yeah. I don't look at that shit. I just, I just if I want it, I just get it. There's and, a, you know, yeah. and sometimes there's that's up, bad. <laughs> there's an upside to being really bad with money. Like I remember being like, like a, I was like, what is a black card? It's like, you just run it. You don't care about it. You, you kind of credit card you run. You don't care about what, what goes on it or whatever. And I was like, but that's the way I am now because I'm yeah, never planning on paying this shit say, back. That's just that's just a credit card. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The only thing I really price compare ever ever word about checking the price for it. I mean, because like you, you, when you're buying the bare minimum of stuff, it's just the stuff you need, right? Like if I need a gallon of milk, I need a gallon of milk. I can't not have a gallon right. of milk, right? Right. So like the only thing I really ever paid attention to the price to is grapes because grapes. The price of grapes varies like fucking cryptocurrency. <laughs> one one drip will be ninety nine cents a pound. The next time it'll be four ninety nine a pound. I've never seen an explainer for it, but like it's like yeah. So grapes, like, grapes will get you because the bag is like three pounds, right? Two or three pounds. So you think you're paying two dollars, but you're paying ten. You have, that's how they fuck you. Yeah. You know? So yeah, that is how they fuck you. You're right. <laughs> if you uh, if you won a hundred million dollars tomorrow in the lottery mm-hmm. or whatever, uh, what would you do? Um, buy a house. Yeah. Uh, Quit working forever. Right. Yes. I would never, yeah. I would never do anything <laughs> yeah. else. I didn't yeah. want to do ever again. Never, yeah, right. not, not, not one moment in my life. I, was like, I don't know when you guys drop these, but does it doesn't matter when Friday it'll come out Friday. Right. Okay. So Cormac McCarthy just died and it was a story yeah. circulating last night and people were arguing about whether it made him an asshole or not. But basically he was like, you only get one life. I don't want to spend, I want to spend as little bit of it, little of it as possible doing stuff I don't want to do. And because he was like undiscovered writer for much of his career, a lot of that meant he was like poor and unemployed. One of his wives, one of his ex-wives was complaining about how they'd be living on beans and bathing in a river so he could write all day. And he'd get a call from a college saying, we'll give you $2,000 to give a speech. And he'd be like, nah, I don't want to do that. Wouldn't do it. They'd still be eating fucking beans. Right. And it was like, made him a shitty husband, but I was kind of like, I absolutely understand. <laughs> I just, I mean, like I, so Cor- Corbett McCarthy rules, you know, he's a mm-hmm. East Tennessee guy, born in Rhode Island, but raised in East Tennessee. And like, I feel like we definitely claim him anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I love Cormac McCarthy, but like that, like, I do like, you know how easy it is to give a talk at a university like that, especially about some shit you already, cause like it was literally the university of Tennessee. I've done that. I've done that exact mm-hmm. gig. I got to ask mm-hmm. by the University of Tennessee to come give a talk about my whatever life. And what it's dude, it's so easy. I remember because I thought yeah. I was signing up for a comedy show, like an hour of stand up. And when I got there and found out, it's like, oh no, it's not a stand up show. It's a talk. Immediately, I was like, a fucking talk. Like I, I can do that shit in my sleep, you know. And it was so easy. Then I got done. When I got done, they were like, oh man. That was like the funniest talk we've ever had. <laughs> I was like, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, it's like, I don't know. I do respect him, but like maybe he just really liked Baines. And so he just genuinely didn't give a shit clearly, but it's like, or it wasn't like getting wife. asked to go <laughs> fucking, you know, build a bridge or some shit. No, uh, somewhere. no I'm just saying Dig ditches. I'm just saying like, you ever read uh, the old Herman Melville story, Bartleby the Scrivener? No. It's this short story where this guy, it's written from the point of view of this guy's boss, who's a lawyer, like a scrivener, is like a, was like a human copy machine who would copy contracts and stuff. So this guy, Barbie, works for him, and he, he's like, he keeps asking him to do stuff, and he goes, I'd prefer not to. And the guy, the guy becomes fascinated with him because he just like, he just keeps saying, I prefer not to to everything to the point where he ends up in debtor's prison and is starving to death because basically on a hunger strike because they offer him food and he goes, I prefer not to, right? And I always really identify with that character. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I would absolutely give the speech for the two thousand dollars. I'm just saying I wouldn't want to, and I admire the bravery of a guy who's like not listening to his wife or his accountant or the government saying he has to pay taxes. He's just like I'm going to bathe in the river and eat beans. I'm not going to give this bullshit talk, even though I would do it because I'm, I'm not I'm not a hero like Cormac McCarthy. <laughs> yeah, what do you think about you know money can't buy happiness? That 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 old chestnut. It's. It's true, but also not beside the point. Like when people say right. that, I'm like, if, mo- if money really makes you unhappy, that's the easiest problem in the world to solve. Write right. me a check right now for your entire net worth, and your pro- your all your problems are gone. Right? Right. But like, 
money can't buy you love or whatever, but all, it does solve all your problems. And if you can't be happy with no fucking problems, right? <laughs> like, like it buys you better healthcare. You're going to be less sick. You're going to be, you're going to be more comfortable. You're going to like not have any worries. You're going to like, you know, know your family is safe and taken care of. You know, the government's actually going to take out, you, you punish a cop if they shoot you. So like, it's, <laughs> they feel it's like, like a, we've talked about this some on the show before, like looked into it and talked about it. First of all, I agree with you. It's like, and there, was it Daniel Taj or somebody had a bit, I can't remember, but it's like, you know, the jet ski bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, like, yeah, yeah, it's a lot harder Tosh. to be sad on a jet ski or something like that. Yeah. You know, like, Just uh, try for riding on a jet ski. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. and I agree with all of that. It's like, it's just easier, you know, yeah, you can be rich and sad, but now you're sad and you've got like a boat and a condo and, you know, in Manhattan and whatever else and all this shit. So it's like, that's better than most people's sad. Uh, but they think they feel like it's oftentimes like the, the children of rich people and everything that are all fucked up <laughs> mentally and whatnot. Cause they like, you know, their parents worked all the time and weren't there for them and they weren't emotionally available or they're like uh, listless and, you know, feel worthless and nothing to do but buy the finest cocaine on earth for all their friends and do it by the pool that, you know, their dad has that that they, uh, you know, lounge beside every day of their life without yeah. having to get a job. And that kind of stuff is hard, Mark. It's hard, you know. Sure. I'm, I'm sorry your dad was emotionally <laughs> absent. My dad was physically absent because he was on yeah. the road working. So I yeah. don't know what to tell you. The, the, it's also like, you ever seen the studies where like the, the saddest income quintile is like people who make $5 million, uh, it, it, Five million dollars a year as status income, like like a uh, range to be in. The yeah, most is it a keeping people. up with the Joneses type thing? Is that what right. it is? Yeah, because you because you're surrounded because you put you in neighborhoods where you're surrounded by people who make 10, 20, 30 million a year, and you're the poorest person in the neighborhood. So like you can't you you you're set for life, but you can't afford private jets. Do you know what I'm saying? Not that right. often anyway. So like it makes you feel like shit. And I'm like, but that just means your mind's broken. Like it just means you your whole personality is revolving around the wrong shit. Because I would never be sad as a $5 million a year person in a $10 million neighborhood. <laughs> I'd be having a fucking blast. I'd be mooching off the $10 million people. It'd be fun. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I think, like, I thought a long time, like, if I just had enough, if I had, like, enough money to know that, like, everything would be okay, even if uh, shit falls apart mm -hmm. for me. You know, if I had enough money to know that, then I'd just be good with everything forever, I've thought. But I don't know. That might not be true. Because I used to think, like, that the issues I had with, like, uh, you know, the big sad or being bummed out or whatever were just because I was, you know, I knew I was destined for artistic greatness. Yet here I was working a desk <laughs> job, right? Working a desk uh, job at the U.S. Department of Energy in Knoxville. Like, that, I thought it was all that. Well, I haven't done that for seven years. And it, you know. It, uh, wherever you go there you are buddy that's what that's what i've found <laughs> so yeah. i don't know if uh my, but like but even if i got super rich and was still all sad and stuff it's like okay but like you know i was sad when i was super poor too all right so it's like right. i've kind of i've kind of earned it i've there you know I, at least there's there's consistency there <laughs> i've i've been up and down through pretty much every economic bracket, but the very, with the, with the top ones, like multiple times, cause I'm a fuck up who chose, wow. you know, unstable career paths. Right. But like, yep. I, so it's like, I've, I've experienced both with knowledge of the previous multiple times and being able to afford food and rent. Yeah. I had to borrow, I had to borrow money to fly home from my dad's funeral for my aunt. Do you right. understand what I'm saying? I was, I got down to having $6 in my checking account multiple times. Uh, I, having a steady paycheck is much better than that in every regard. And if you can't, if you can't figure out how to find happiness with all the resources in the world. It really is a there, wherever you go there, you are a problem. You should just fucking kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just, yeah, I don't know. Would you buy like a bunch of fancy shit and stuff though? If you suddenly had all this, you already kind of said that you said you'd still be driving a Toyota. Like there's no kind of like big luxurious thing, uh, you know, that you'd allow yourself to have an indulgence of some kind. If you suddenly were know. rich as fuck. I have a rich buddy who does, he doesn't own a car. He subscribes to a car. Uh, With that, is that different from leasing a car? How's that different from leasing a car? So there are companies you pay like a monthly fee to, 
and you can just trade in and get a different oh, car anytime you it's want. It's like a Netflix for cars or something where it's like, there you yeah. go. The old DVD Netflix for the cars. Old DVD, yeah. Like, right. Well, that's yeah. How much that cost a month? Am I'm not allowed depend- to know. We're not, we're not allowed to know. It's fine. If we're not, <laughs> I think, <laughs> if I think he tells you, don't like tell the, everybody else. You it might, they might come for you, Mark. If you're not, <laughs> no, I think he was do. I think he, there are different tiers depending on what kind of cars you want. I think he was doing like the nice sedan version, which was like 700 bucks a month. So he was getting like, you get like, uh, you know, maybe a low end, Beamer or like a high end, you know, SUV or something. Um, well, shit, seven hundred dollars so, a month isn't like that much more than like a you know a payment for like a nice car, and, right? You know, and if you if you're an actor in Los Angeles who's in a, in a town all the time, it sort of makes financial sense because you have instead of paying for a car that's sitting there unused for yeah. months, you just cancel your subscription for three months and reactivate it when you go back to town, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, but that's the kind of cost saving money that's only available to rich people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but like it's, it, but the, I'd probably do something like that. But like, is but I never understood people that have like a bunch of different houses. I guess it's an investment, but like, why can't you yeah. just stay in a hotel? Like, why I got, I got, I don't need a house in the south of France. I can go fucking stay in a hotel in the south I of think France. It's, I think it's, there an invest, it's like, it is an investment thing. I mean, that's like part of people that plus the Airbnbers and the house flippers and all that shit. And then private equity and all mm-hmm. those things combined are, you know, why the housing market fucking sucks the way it does right now. Uh, mm-hmm. So that don't hit, but yeah, that's why yeah. people do it. Cause it doesn't ever go down. It doesn't depreciate. It's like, you might as well own it. It's like, you know, like having a gallery of fine art or something. What about that? Where, where are you at on art? We were just talking about art last week, like the most pretentious art of all time. Uh, like there was a guy, an Italian artist in the sixties who pooped in a bunch of cans and sealed it up. Right. And sold it to people. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. it was, uh, near de de artiste. Right. Uh, so artist shit, shit of an artist. Uh, one of those tens went for like $200,000 or something like that. Uh, that type of stuff. Like, you know, what do you think about all of that? You, any kind of art fan? I'm talking purely just visual art right now. Not, not art as in, as it includes. TV writing and film and all that, like none of that music, none of that shit. Uh, I never, it's not really something I ever think about, but I did go, my, my mom was visiting one time. We went to the Getty museum out here in LA yeah. and they had a Monet exhibit. And I really like, Oh, look at it. I was like, I'm staring at the picture of like 15 minutes and really did like feel stuff, you know, but it's not something I'd be like, I, never, I don't think about, like, Oh man, I got to go. But like <laughs> speaking of miserable rich people, do you know, John, how much do you know about John Paul Getty's life? No, it, is that is he the one that they made the movie about all the money in the world? Yeah, where so, Kevin Spacey was playing him, and Kevin Spacey raped, and everybody found out he was raping, and so they replaced mm-hmm. him with Christopher Plummer and redid the whole movie in like six weeks' time or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the movie's about he like the time had a that... grandson who got kidnapped or something, and and Getty was like, "I'm oh, fuck that little bitch." <laughs> or yeah, he wouldn't yeah, pay yeah. the ransom. Yeah, right. The, 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 the kidnappers. <laughs> This is the movie's version of the story. The kidnappers were like nice to the kid. They just wanted money. Yeah. So when he refused to pay, they were like, I'm sorry, but we have to cut your ear off. And they sent it to John Paul King. <laughs> yeah. They still wouldn't pay. So the, uh, but he was, he was at one point was the richest man in the world, but he was convinced the world the economy was going to collapse. So he was like hoarding art because he thought that'd be the new currency in the new economy or whatever. Anyway, he died miserable. His whole family fucking hated him. So when they inherited all this art as a fuck you to him, they basically made it free for the public to look at, which is the last thing in the world he would ever would have wanted. So anyway, that's a, that's a story about a, a guy who had all literally all the money in the world and was a miserable prick and his family hated him. Uh, yeah. yeah. It happens a lot. <laughs> Scrooge McDuck. He's like that, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but not uh, Ebenezer Scrooge as well. It's a tale as old as time. Really? Uh, it seems like it is actually a real thing though, but uh, <laughs> you make me think of uh, some, Oh, we've also talked about it on here before I've found and uh, looking shit up to do this show used to be like rich people, like high upper class people, high class people or whatever that used to come with a sort of inherent understanding or obligation that you were going to like be worthy of your status. Right. So like they used to like, they used to like go to war like actually go to war and stuff as like a thing. And now today, well, Prince, Prince Harry went to war. Up. Do what? Yeah. Prince Harry went to war. Yeah. Right. That, well, they're like, yeah. you know, they're like the Royals. They still like try to uphold that kind of bullshit. Obviously that, you know, whatever, but like used to, they all do that. Now in the modern era, it's the exact opposite, you know, fucking, it ain't me. I ain't no Senator son. Fucking that's how it works now. 
people draft dodge, but they used to like all go to war, but not just that. They used to also like, they gave, they gave back, they'd build fucking orphanages or like school, like shit like that. Like they do like they, there was part of it was for a long time. Like they would be ashamed and would be shamed by others if they didn't like at least pretend to, you know, give some of it back or try to do some good for the world or whatever with their money. Right. But that is just Uh completely gone. I feel like, well, like some of them still do it. I'm not saying they don't, but it's not like, it's not like an expectation of the bourgeois or whatever anymore. Like, in fact, it's the opposite. You expect them to be greedy assholes who don't do anything like that. And it's like a big deal when they do do stuff like that. Whereas it used to be the standard. Well, part of that is sort of like, you know, Lot, reputation laundering like the Sacklers putting their name on a bunch of museums like the you know yeah but yeah car, so but like the thing about it's like to me it's like old money versus new money right the thing about old money is they have ancestral knowledge of like revolutions yeah. right <laughs> so yeah you, you might strike break at your steel factory but you, then you put sponsored by the Carnegie Mellon Institute on Sesame Street and the people are less likely to fucking murder you mm-hmm. but like like I got a, a friend of a friend uh, who was married into, um, was the get, yeah, the Getty, the Getty estate. And they have a compound in Northern California that you can't find because it's not on Google maps. They had it taken off, but it's like, like a subdivision of mansions in the middle of this giant redwood forest, like everything you could ever want there. They used to own the redwood forest. They donated it to the state. So basically, so no one ever, else would ever be able to acquire it to turn it into a park. So the state protects their secret estate. When you drive up to the gate, you have to give away all your electronics because you can't take pictures of it. Yeah. They're so wealthy. They don't want the outside world to know they have any of that shit. That's old money. Bro, bro. New money is posted on Instagram. Right. Yes. <laughs> They're Saudi oil princes and and shit like that they they got like super yachts right and these super yachts have like lasers on them that disable cameras from however far away so it's like so you're not because you're not you are not permitted to gaze upon their hits right like, like mm-hmm. and so and but yeah they have like cameras and drone or lasers and drones and shit that like prevent being spied on so nobody ever knows what they're doing or what they're how many whores they're throwing off that boat you know <laughs> And at what clip or or whatever? <laughs> there, there was a there was a burglary ring out here that like people were trying to figure out how they knew when to rob their houses, and it was just Instagram. They yeah. follow celebrities on Instagram and see where they're on vacation to go rob their house. And the people were people were still Instagramming their fancy vacations and the parties they had at their fancy houses, so burglars could scout before they fucking went to knew what to take. It's like <laughs> old money must look at that and be like, "God, you fucking stupid," you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you have any desire to, uh, I don't know how to put it. If you got rich, super, super rich, would you just be a recluse? Like, uh, seal yourself up. Like you wouldn't try to like, you know, infiltrate that world or whatever. Right. Like, no, nah. like what if they like invited you to, to come around? They wouldn't. You're fucking garbage. They would never do that. No matter how much money you had. Okay. Mm-hmm. They would never, but if they did, you know, how would you respond? If they invited me to like Illuminati sex party? Yeah. Uh-huh. So like drink a drink adrenochrome and all that shit. Uh yeah, nah, I'm not yeah. really into that. Uh I like having uh boring sex with my wife. That's my that's my speed. <laughs> I've been you've been in situations boring, like yeah. situations sort of not like that, but like a, in that ballpark. Like I I've said before, genuinely I can't go to the Pacific Palisades, dude, just like the neighborhood, right? Without being like physically uncomfortable the whole time I'm there. Like, I I just feel like, I just, I feel like, I don't know. I'm not supposed to be here. (laughs) They can tell. They can smell me. I don't know. I just don't feel right. I feel, I just, I feel uncomfortable and out of place, even in like a real fancy neighborhood, let alone, you know, a situation like that. Yeah, I mean, I had to. Uh... <laughs> oh, here's a, here's a here's a fun uh, rich person story. So we get invited to to my wife's friend her um, her uh, rehearsal dinner, 
And this friend lived simple, had no idea it came from like money, I mean, money, money. Like your dad founded like a tech company kind of shit. And uh, I wanted to get out of it. I was like, we're just dating. I don't know these people that well. I, I, a rehearsal dinner feels like really personal to like for me to go to. Plus I'd rather be doing other shit. So you can know, so put on, I got, I got a sport coat from the thrift store. My now wife and girlfriend makes me go to this thing. And we walk up and the restaurant's closed for a private event. And we go like, I thought we had a reservation for the names X and she, and they go, no, you're, you're on the list. Come on in. We come in. There's like aerialists and flame and people breathing fire, completely open cash bar. They'd rented out a fancy Beverly Hills restaurant or Hollywood restaurant on a Saturday night, Friday night. And I'm like, that's how we found out they had it like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, and I was, I was, I'm wearing a, a, a sport coat. I got from a thrift store for $7, but yeah, I, I always feel like people can tell, but I didn't, but I, I never feel uncomfortable because it's just like, what, what are they going to do? They're going to point and laugh at me? I don't know. Maybe I smell funny. I just don't like it. <laughs> I'd rather be in like my buddy's garage getting drunk or something. But uh, yeah, uh, the, the what, you know what's wild is those the flame eaters and acrobats and stuff. That's mm -hmm. like a really, really, really niche thing, obviously, that I feel like doesn't have the best long term prospects as a career, <laughs> right? But, like, if you can get known in that industry, you're going to get hired for a lot of high-end private functions being thrown by, like, Saudi princes or fucking the sons of billionaires or something. You know what I mean? Like, they won't. Uh -huh. they, they love that shit. They love that, like, fucking circus tent show stuff to be going on, you know, while they're all getting drunk at fucking Borgia's or whatever the name of the place is. Uh Yeah. It's an, I, it's an interesting doc that, you know, they're poor as shit live in squalor probably, but get like, you know, ferried around to some of these like super high end places and events and stuff. It's gotta be an odd lifestyle, which I guess, you know, that when you go into flame eating, uh, that you know, it's going to be, there's a, going to be a little unorthodox, but yeah. As, as you know, I'm a big basketball fan, and I have uh, NBA League Pass when the season's going on. And one of the cool thing about things about it, it doesn't show the commercials or whatever. It always it just it's, the camera stays on like the on court entertainment or the halftime entertainment. So like, if you flip around, you'll see like different versions of weird halftime entertainers, and they they travel between cities. So you'll see them in different cities every night. It's so, like one of them's called a Red Panda. She rides a unicycle and stacks bowls and stuff. All right. Yeah. Another guy like does like handstands that his little tiny dog bounces on his foot i'm like so that career path is either you go on america's got talent you do nba halftime shows or you fucking die yeah <laughs> it's like how much time how, how do you figure out you can swallow a sword or balance a dog on your foot or sp or, or ride a unicycle where you're spinning plates you know it doesn't like a lot know. of fucking practice dude but for what like th then what like you said there's like you got to get on that nba halftime circuit or you know and there's only, only 30, 31 teams, which means there's a, a maximum there's 15 home games a night. And so if there's, there's enough work for 15 people to move between you, 15 people out of 7 billion in the world, how many people are out there spinning plates for no reason as well is what I want to know. I want to meet the amateur who didn't make it. <laughs> also, how many, like, they wouldn't probably want them more than once in the same season, right? I don't know. They might. You might have a lot, you know. Yeah. But, uh, I think I'll see the, you'll see them the same ones three or four times per team or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. All right. This is something I know that the audience has been dying for me to ask. I'm sure they've been wondering when I'm going to bring it up the whole time. I want to know where you stand on uh, the idea that squirrels have the capacity to love. Uh, what do you? I know that doesn't. I know that doesn't seem to be directly related to fancy people, and in fact, it's not. <laughs> but it's deeply entwined with the lore of this show. Uh, squirrels, rodents. You know them. Forest dwelling tree fuckers. Right? Do you think? they can feel love all right so i thought <laughs> i've not of this specifically with squirrels but i thought about it with dogs a lot because every like once a okay. month there's a new story out that goes viral it says dogs are just programmed to get you to, to behave how you, they think will get you give them food they don't actually have any feelings or any sort of affection towards you and i'm like yeah for sure okay to a degree but also like what do you think love is like right Love is my dog feels safe with me. She knows I take care of her. She knows I provide for her. 
Like, how is okay. that different than what a kid feels towards a parent? You know? Okay. I, I didn't. I didn't say dogs, Mark. Even even in no, the no, original. No. Not, even in. Okay. All right. I, I'm saying that this the, the people that tro- do those troll studies haven't really thought about what human love is either. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, I love my dog because I go through the act of caring for it. Right. So, I mean, to bring me to my point, I've, I've I've seen people have squirrels as pets. Right. So if that squirrel is being fed and protected by a person and cared for by it, it probably it sees when it smells that person's probably like, oh yeah, that person, that's cool. I don't know if that's love. I think love it, goes a little bit beyond just that. Like, oh yeah, that person, they won't let me die. That's that's great. Like they appreciate that, but uh, but yeah, I don't know if it counts as love or not. Who's to say? I mean, like, what 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 is what is what is love, Trey? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's like a higher order function. That's what I think. It's like it goes beyond just like instinctual levels of, uh, you know, associating someone with protection or or whatever else. It's like mm-hmm. a, it's a strong feeling that's hard to hard to explain. So I got kids, right? And this is very cheesy. It's also a cliche. It's a cheesy cliche. The worst of all things. But I've heard people describe, I've heard other people describe having a kid as like having your heart walking around outside your body, which I fully agree with. I said that to Drew once. Drew's having a baby later this year, but I said it to Drew years ago. And he goes, what the fuck does that even mean? That's literally how he responded to it, right? (laughs) And And I was like, well, it's like, you know, and I couldn't elaborate on it. Like when I heard that, it made perfect fucking sense to me. Drew heard it and he was like, what kind of fucking hackneyed bullshit is that? And like, I couldn't bridge that gap or whatever, but I know how it feels to have children and this like intense feeling. That's like overwhelming. Right. Of Mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah. Love and devotion and fear, terror, all that wrapped up into one thing. And like squirrels will sometimes eat their babies. Okay. Like, So I think it's fucking different is what I'm saying. And like Corey was making a case that like they, you know, mourn their dead for like lengthy amounts of time because Corey found out that squirrels are territorial and live in the same general area for their whole lives. So he was like, if I see a squirrel that's been killed by a truck, I know that that squirrel's whole family is waiting on them to come home that night and like distraught over the fact that he's not. And it makes me sad. And I start crying. Corey said that. And I started laughing at him. I was like, dude, that's not how fucking squirrels work dog. And that led to this huge argument about how squirrels work. Even in the course of the argument, I, I allowed to Corey, he brought up dogs. I was like, sure. Dogs can love you. Sure. Like, so, and I think like primates, elephants, fucking whales, maybe, like some semblance of what we call love, but I think pretty much most every other animal, uh, I just, I, I don't think, I don't think they got it like that. Is it, they right, don't have so, the capa- it, they don't have the luxury of that type of shit. That's one of the things I said to court. It's like, f- f- cause fuck, unless they're like domesticated, that's why pets I think are different. That's one of the reasons I think dogs are different. Right. But animals that live in the wild, dude, they ain't got time for any of that fucking fruit, fruit, Disney movie right. horse shit. Like it, existence they, is metal and you know, right. hardcore. Okay, that, that's actually what I want to point out, sort of wanted to make. Like, so like if I wanted to be a cynic, like the people posting those dog studies or whatever. Um, I would say that like, like my grandfather, I, I guess saved my life once we were riding, we were riding around the farm on his horse and uh, the saddle broke and he, he curled and covered it. He used his body to, to, to shield me. I broke his ribs or whatever. So, um, but like you probably would say you're willing to die for your kids or whatever, but also yeah. if I want to be cynical about it, I would say, well, like you're hardwired by evolution to feel that way because it's more rational for species, the species and continuing your line, right? They're the next generation. They have more life left. They're supposed to be better versions of you. If evolution, natural selection works the way it's supposed to go. And I would say that like, but part of that is yes, my grandfather, he already knew he had already lived most of his life, right? It's, it's coldly rational for him to save my life, to continue the family line. It's also like, but squirrels' lives are harder. It is more metal. So yeah. if you have a litter of six, I don't know, what are baby squirrels? Six baby squirrels, and you only have can make enough milk to feed four, doesn't it make sense to eat the last two? Like, isn't mm-hmm. it rational for a dog to eat the runt of the litter so the other, the rest of the puppies might live? 
So like, isn't everyone just acting important? If I wanted to be a huge asshole, I would say that love isn't real. And we're all oh, just okay. I get, all right. Yeah. I just now got where you were going. It's like, so you're saying yeah. nothing can love. That's a, that's a, no, that's I don't, a, I don't that's a different agree with take, that. which I, <laughs> I, don't actually, I don't actually agree with that. I'm just saying you can slice this all kinds of different ways. Yeah, right? sure. Sure. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Do squirrels get married? Do, do, I mean, I, like, I wouldn't think that penguins are capable of love each either, but I've seen a documentary where, a, where you know, penguins made for life. It yeah. Was, usually a penguin left her husband for another male penguin and the guy went and fought over her and got his ass whipped. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like, does that penguin capable of love? He seemed heartbroken in the, in the, in the, in the video I saw. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have to look more into penguins, you know, maybe, uh, yeah. but fox squirrels anyway. Uh, Food. All right. We've, me and Corey and you have had a lot of little tete-a-tetes about food. We make fun of you because we're big fat fuck uh, garbage disposals and you eat healthy and we shit on you for that because we're insecure. (laughs) But like, we make fun of you for not like knowing what hits. You know what I mean? Like, uh, because... We're like, oh, Mark, go make your fucking white bean chili fucking, you know, or whatever. Y'all like... like the main the main thing is y'all like food piles, like food piles, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like like one of the, when started this fight was like Corey had like lump crab meat on top of a steak or something, and I was like, why the fuck would you do? That? Both these things are great by themselves, but like they Bro, don't mix them together does not hit for me. I buddy, don't understand it. You can go to a fancy ass steakhouse and they'll have a crab meat add on for a steak. That's not that weird of a thing. But I get what you're. But anyway, it's perfect. It brings us perfectly to it. So like. What's the faint? You ever been to like a Michelin star or multi Michelin star place? You ever had that experience? And what what was your experience with it? And how do you feel about the world of like fancy ass food? I'll tell you, I, I went to it was a a, a pretty hidden friends financially hidden friends ber- wife's birthday. It took all of us to Spago, which is was a whose restaurant is that? One of those? I don't know. You know it's, it's funny. You know me. I, I don't even remember what I was saying, but I said something about yeah. So you can eat your whatever at Borgia's or whatever I said. I meant Spago. Uh-huh. That's what I. That's what I meant okay. to say, but I I couldn't remember what the actual name of it was, so I just pulled the word out of my ass. Uh, oh, it's Wolf, Wolfgang Puck's restaurant. Okay. Yeah. So that's probably. I don't know if it has a Michelin star. I, don't, I doubt it because I think it's a very specific thing. But like, I will tell you one of the best meals of my life. Like even like they had regular food on the menu, like pizza, like as an appetizer. It was the best pizza I ever had in my fucking life. The the best raw oysters I ever had in my life. And I was like, why with the raw oysters? I was like, oh, what you're paying for is the amount they throw away. They only give you like the best smelling one for every nine they throw away. That's why it's expensive, right? And I was like, oh shit. But I, I, I couldn't afford that. I would never do that myself. But yeah, it was a, it was a really good meal. But um, I think I had some... Somebody else bought me some nice sushi in Vegas. That was nice. Um, yeah, the nicest restaurant I go to it, out here is a you and I's favorite spot, Smokehouse. Yeah. Yeah. But you ever see these internet videos and stuff of these places that like, you know, people order a thousand dollar steak and it comes out in a gold briefcase that opens up like like no. Marcellus Wallace's briefcase in Pulp Fiction with a light shining out of it. And the steak itself has got like gold, edible gold dust and all this fucking bullshit on it. Like- no. I hate that shit. Yeah. And yeah. So you do too. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I'm, I'm fine with, I'm fine ordering through a clown's mouth and doing a maze in the back of a placemat. <laughs> yeah. I don't care. Uh, so, but you do, you are a healthy eater generally, right? General. Yeah. Okay. So this is where the two, um, sort of overlap. This is a relatively internet famous thing. I'm about to show you. You may or may not have seen it before, but I thought about it. Because, yeah, like I said, healthy and pretentious shit overlap in the world of food. Can you see that? My day on a plate. I can't really yeah. read it. Pete, it's my name, Pete Evans. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll read it. This is, so this guy, this is from some magazine. This chef, Pete Evans, lays out his day on a plate. So I'll read it, you know, uh, in chronological order here. 7 a.m. Two glasses of alkalized water with apple cider vinegar and then a smoothie of blended alkalized water, organic spirulina, activated almonds, maca, blueberries, stevia, coconut, kefir, and two organic free-range eggs. Um, See, do you blend the raw eggs even with with the almonds and stuff? Sounds like it. I guess so. Okay. You know what those things uh, are? Spirulina? No. 
I don't know what spirulina is. Maca, kefir, no. not Sutherland. No. <laughs> what about activated almonds? You know what activated almonds are? I, I apparently have only ever had inact, inactive almonds. I don't know. I will say that's because you're poor and don't hit. <laughs> Uh, now I, now I, I mean, do you know, like, are you familiar with activated almonds? If I had to guess, does it mean that, does that mean they've sprouted? I think you, I, and I don't even know either, but I think it's like, I think you put them in water for a bit, but then take them out or something. So it's like, they're gonna sprout, but haven't quite like okay. they, you've started the, but I don't, I don't even know. Uh, 8 30 AM sprouted millet sorghum. I didn't know any, you know, I didn't know we still were doing sorghum past like the old West, but this guy is sprouted millet, sorghum, chia and buckwheat bread with liver pate, avocado, cultured vegetables. None of those Philistine vegetables that you might be eating plus ginger and licorice root tea. All right. So every Twice in an hour and a half, he's had uh, half a meal with like 400 ingredients. So, which it tells me is he has help, right? He has what? Or this is his, he has help, like hired help, or this is, or yeah. this is his full time job. <laughs> I mean, what well, does say, it, to be fair to him, I guess, it does say he's some kind of chef. So maybe this is sort of related to his full time. But I thought the same thing. It's like, this is just such a ridiculous, like what, I mean, what's your daily uh, food routine? Like just generally, uh, obviously it like changes for, each day, but I'm, I'm meal prep, like a couple packs of chicken breasts and keep them in a Tupperware and then I'll make a sandwich wrap. Cause like, like this is too much work. Whatever he's uh -huh, doing. This absolutely. Is some <laughs> I try to do the same. I, I like to cook, but I like to cook once a day generally. Right. Cause every time you cook, it's like, you got to clean shit up and whatever. So like I'll cook dinner and we get like hello fresh and stuff. So it's something like relatively nice and enjoyable. But for lunch, I just like, well, sorry, excuse me. Oh Lord, I just throw something together or uh, leftovers, or try to get those little like uh, you know, you know they got like fancy versions of lean cuisines now. Sometimes I'll get those oh, from uh, mm -hmm. podcast sponsors, whatever. But whatever I got, but I damn sure am not going to you know forage for blueberries and wherever the hell you even go to get sorghum uh, nowadays. I'm not going to. The the you, old, know, you don't have a sorghum guy? Old, no, I don't. No. Yeah, I go down to the old West General you, store. Try yeah, a bag you, of uh, beans. I'll give you uh give you my hookup. He's got sorghum, he's got loudinum, he's got the Coca-Cola oh, yeah. cocaine in it, you know. He'll pull your teeth. That's what didn't Dennis used to prescribe drugs? That was a yeah. Yeah. Oh, but dude, shit. Most of that stuff you named, you could just like go down to the pharmacy and pick up. Yeah. Uh like, you know, and it, it was for kids. Like, uh, like kids cough syrup had heroin in it, you know, she like that. the good old day. There was like, there was a cold medicine that they had once that had like, had like alcohol, heroin, codeine, and like cocaine or something like that. Or laudanum, you know, one of those old timey ones, all like all in an over the counter tonic you could get. And it's like, well, I mean, you know, bet that shit worked. You think, you think we should be able to go to the pharmacy and buy stuff like that? If you want to, uh, you're asking if I'm a libertarian. Uh, I think I it'd can't. probably be pretty bad for society if you could just buy heroin at the great drugstore. Although then, I guess there's an argument like that safe needle injection sites are actually better for people, like harm, harm, what do you yeah. call it, harm reduction. People are gonna um, do it anyway. I think it's just like I don't know. I don't see legalize it, regulate it, same way you do fucking booze and tobacco and whatever else. I don't really see what the difference is all that much. I mean, the thing about heroin is there's like <laughs> thousands of albums that are love letters to heroin. Yeah. There's like, so it must be fucking so awesome that people can't, you know, it's like, it must be the most amazing feeling in the world. So therefore I feel like the government should keep it away from us as much as possible. I mean, you ever been on pills? You never, you ain't never been on no. pills? Never? No. no. You ain't never had no surgeries or nothing? I mean, I must, they must've given me something when I had my wisdom teeth out. But like, I, I, I yeah. don't. When I had my wisdom teeth out, I got I, I, it was a real trash, rural southern trash operation, right? They were like dentist in a van that went community <laughs> to community. I'm not kidding. You had your teeth well, out in a van? Yeah, dude. They might as well have been wearing fucking clown masks, dude. I swear to God. <laughs> it was horrific. Uh, but the upside is, operation <laughs> like that, you'll be utterly unsurprised to hear. They prescribed me way 
too many pain pills, like far beyond what I needed for that operation. Cause it was, you know, mm. it was like 2002 in rural Tennessee. And <laughs> that's just how, that's just how everybody rolled back then. And, uh, it was a, it was a hell of a two or three weeks. I can tell you that much. And it almost there got were- ugly. I'm not going to lie. I almost fell into that trap. Uh, the scourge of my family and community. It almost happened. I ran out and I went to my butt, my cousin's house. I had a cousin also named Trey. That's how uh, trash we are. But yeah, I went to my cousin Trey's house and I knew his dad had pain pills for his back or whatever. And I tried to get him to like steal his dad's pills. And he was like, and he was like, dude, what, what the fuck's wrong with you? I'm not and in my head though. I was like, why is he being a dick about this? Like, that's what's wild about it. Like I can remember that. Like I can remember in the moment being like, what's his fucking problem? Why is he acting like I'm being some kind of asshole or so? Why is, why, why is he doing this to me? Why is he fucking me up, you know, by not stealing his dad's pills or whatever, but he wouldn't do it. I went to bed mad or, you know, and then like within a day or two, I was fine. And I was like, holy shit, I was this close to being a full bore pill head, but buddy, mm-hmm. a lot of fun. I've had multiple surgeries, uh, in the past few years. Cause I'm an, uh, I'm a cursed individual and, um, you know, it's a good time. I, I, I thought that Aquaman was one of the preeminent cinematic experiences of, of like the past three <laughs> years because because I saw it the night I had a sinus surgery and was on so many pills. So I've never had heroin, but I definitely, I mean, I feel like I get it and it does hit, you know, but like yeah. not enough to like lose your family and eat scabs. Uh, don't get me wrong. So, yeah, it's like uh, the drugs are another one of those like, like, Venn diagram things, right? Where it's like, yes, I you, covered that one. I covered drugs. You have a, here. you have the surgery van, and rich people have Michael Jackson's doctor. Yeah, right. <laughs> I thought, dude, did you not? I really thought, like, and look, I wouldn't be all about this either way. I still, I'm not gonna lie, I found it mildly disappointing. I thought when I got to Hollywood, there'd be a lot more, like just bowls of cocaine and things like that. You know what I mean? Like that's just all gone. Either that, or I just just have never even remotely hit hard enough for that to, for that to present itself. But it's, uh, it don't be like that. Most people are pretty like boring or if they hit, they hide their hits or whatever. You know, it's not like it used to be, um, Hollywood. I've seen, I've seen people take cocaine out at parties where they, uh, uh, where they shouldn't be. And I've heard stories about actors that like that are, that are doing cocaine on set and stuff. But the thing is like, it's much more professionalized than it used to be. And it's also much more like the money's bigger for, for, for the people at the top. Right. So like people have like Adderall prescriptions and shit now, right. I think because, is a big part because of they it, need, you know, and it was Impic. Right. Yeah. And like right. for the weight loss and like uh, HGH to look younger and yeah. steroids to get jacked for a movie. Like they're, they're on, they're on a ton of drugs, but they're, they're performance enhancing drugs right. because you can't look like Jim Belushi and do Coke and get to be on TV anymore. Right. Right. You gotta, yeah. you gotta pick a lane. So yeah, there was a, I mean, there was people were joking to like the, when, you know, they thought even if you follow the federal government's basically cracked down on Adderall and there was like, well, Hollywood's about to fucking shut down. <laughs> yeah. Is that what happened with the shortage? My wife, my wife has an Adderall. She's had an Adderall prescription for as long as I've known her. She's been diagnosed with ADHD for forever. But I know f- yeah. from her that there's been a big Adderall shortage. But it's not a shortage. It's like a crackdown. Because I thought it was like a supply chain issue or something. It is a supply chain issue because the government, where how it schedules narcotics, controls the precursor ingredients. So they, they, they're allowing less manufacture of the precursor ingredients because... They think too many people are taking Adderall, which is probably true, but they can't it's tell. Definitely true, bro. <laughs> they they can't tell who who. But I, the, the government yeah. doesn't know who actually needs it, who doesn't. That's well, what that's what I was about to say. Doctor, that is definitely true, but I still don't think what they're doing is cool because, like, there's right. definitely people it's, who genuinely need it, and right now nobody can fucking get it. So, like, right. all they've done is. I can't believe the federal government fucked something up as it pertains to like <laughs> drug regulation or drug policy or whatever. That's so weird, not a character for them. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's also like when you do it that way, you're not going to stop some like rich person with an office job who has a hard time focusing on their job because it's boring as shit. You're just taking it out of the hands of like a kid with actual ADHD who's trying to get through school. Yeah, so right. yeah, it's 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 fucking stupid. But talking it about is. like Ozempic, like the the Venn diagram, baby, Ozempic's like oh, you're, they invented a miracle drug that keeps you thin. Oh, you mean like every Meth? Other drug? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, we talked about that on here on a recent episode, talking about how like the diet pills in like the fifties and shit for housewives and stuff was just mm-hmm. 
just it's hardcore not- speed, bro. That's just all it was. And uh, they was all on it. You know, they was vacuuming their asses off, boy. Literally. Uh, anyway. How are we How are we alive? I was reading, I was yeah. reading uh, this was like revolution <laughs> podcast about the Revolutionary War. And like at the time of the founding, the average American, this is men, women, and children, all drank like, on, on average, drank uh, like over a liter of whiskey a day. Mm-hmm. And that's a contributing factor to, this, to, to the Revolutionary War is that we were all drunk as shit and hyped up on conspiracy theories and just fucking angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah it's like we've always been this way it's the fucking I mean, yeah, belligerent. And like in the 60s uh, the wives are all on speed at home vacuuming their asses off and all the husbands were like fucking hammered by 130 in their you know board meeting or whatever like they're all drinking whiskey after lunch, three martini lunches and all that type of shit like the mm-hmm. white collar husbands anyway i don't know what the, yeah i'm sure the, i'm sure the fucking construction workers were hammered too or were on something but <laughs> Dude, this guy, my, my dad ran a construction crew uh, when I was a teenager, and uh, the guy that operated the motor, you know what a motor grader is? It's motor the, it's grader? A, I know what a rogue grader is. You, maybe we use the same words for different things, but when I worked, we, we called it a motor grader, but it was like, there's a blade on the bottom that shapes yes. the road. I, it that was, it over. I, when I worked for the highway department, we called that a rogue <laughs> grader. I have no okay. idea if we're right or you're right, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, so the guy who operated, he was brilliant at it. He's fucking amazing, which is like, it takes a lot of skill to operate that kind of precision heavy machinery. Uh, he drank all day. He was, he would drink beers until like three before he, that was, that was him being responsible. He switched yeah, right. to hard liquor only after like three o'clock. <laughs> but he was drunk as shit, operating like a 15 ton piece of machinery perfectly. It's just like, yeah, a, that was at generation. the Clay County Highway Department, at least. That was like the senior operator position was the guy who did the road grader. Like, that was like, there was like yeah. truck drivers and there was the roller and the oil truck and all the very, you know, pieces of machinery. The guy in the road grader, he was like, he was like the top guy, basically. Yeah. I don't know if that's common or what, but that's how it worked there. It takes a, that, that maybe a track will probably take the most skill. Um, but yeah, they, the only equipment they let me operate was I, I, I ran a bulldozer pushing pan, the pans, the big dirt movers, the blades in the bottom of the scoop. Yeah. And like to, to get more dirt scooped up, you, you push the back of it with the, with the bulldozer. Bro, get more power. They didn't let my eighteen year old ass run nothing. It was, I sat I sat on a bucket kind of holding a flag. That's what I was doing. Yeah. yeah the only the only skill in that is you want to inch up and, and, and start pushing slowly because if you bump it too hard, you you you, 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 you shake the guy operating the pan. But yeah. they also let me operate a steamroller, which requires no skill whatsoever. You cannot wreck it. It's too heavy to flip over. It's funny. The dude <laughs> the dude it's funny. you say it requires no skill to operate it. The guy who ran our, our roller on the crew, uh his I don't want to say his actual last name, but his nickname was Plum Dumb. That's what everybody called him, Plum Dumb. <laughs> and he was the roller operator. And I was a couple, I was a few notches below Plum Dumb on the uh, hierarchy <laughs> there, uh, easily. Yeah. But uh, wherever he's at, I hope he's doing well. All right. Uh, I need to make a, an announcement for everybody. Normally, Mark, what we do right here is we read emails, airmail, we call it, from the airheads, we call them. But... Corey is the keeper of the airmail. He's not here this week. I could have had him forward me some, but I did not even think about it until you and I had already sat down and started recording. So I'm sorry Mm -hmm. to the airheads. I am not equipped currently to read any airmail. I had a lack of foresight. And for that, I apologize. But Corey should be back next week. And so will y'all's missives from beyond the airhead veil. And, uh, but thank you, Mark, for sitting in for Corey. It was fun. Appreciate it. And, uh, if you got any, I mean, I don't, you got anything you want to plug or anything? Watch the weekly skews with Trey <laughs> yeah, Crowder and Mark Asia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Weekly skews, our other show. Check it out. If you like <laughs> politics, talk. If you don't, keep listening to this dumbass shit here. Thank you guys for being here. We appreciate it. And uh, stay fancy, motherfuckers. So you love you. Bye. Skew. Here's Lydia Loveless. One, two, mm-hmm. three, four. One, two, three, four. Royalty and rednecks are alike. They both like cutting and picking fights. Biscuits and baked beans where they don't belong. Sit on down with Corey and Trey and learn some fancy shit today. We'll laugh a little even when they're wrong. They'll take you to a magical place where if you call someone a cut, nobody cares. They keep it debonair at putting on airs, putting on airs, putting on airs.